All right, everyone, today we are here with a very exciting guest. We are here with Dario Nardi, and he is a neuroscience researcher who is, as far as I'm aware, the only person who's currently doing research into the intersection between Myers-Briggs types and cognitive functions and neuroscience. Um, so he actually looks at how the mind responds to stimulation uh, based on what your cognitive functions are and which type preferences you have. So he's a senior lecturer at UCLA, He's been certified in type since 1994. And if you've been around the type community for any length of time, there is an almost 100% chance that you've heard of this guy, that you love his work. Uh, and if you don't already know and love him, you're about to. Um, so Dario, thank you so much for doing this interview. I am so excited to have you. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe start us off with just a little bit of info about what the field of neuroscience can tell us about our personality types. Okay, yeah, the, thank you so much for having me. Um, there, there was a lot over the past 25 years and my original training was very much around what's called action research or phenomenological research, things like interviewing people to find out uh, what it's like to be them in their own words. And uh, the brain up here is the hardware and that's what my equipment can look at. It can look at the activity that's going on, the electrical activity, measure that, uh, reported in different ways. There's actually a lot of different ways to report. It's very rich. Uh, it has a tradition. I follow very traditional ways of working with it since the 70s, uh, traditional equipment, all of that. And um, mind is the stuff that we think about with like cognitive functions. So it's, and, and if we think of something even like you, you're given a list and you have to sort the list in alphabetical order, that's something a computer can do. It's something a human being can do. Uh, I've even seen elephants do this in Bali. So, you know, it, it's uh, mind is about the information processing and is not just the brain. And then psyche is what Jung talked about. And that's, you know, when, although people are very excited about cognitive functions, it is really that developmental piece that Jung talked about, the confrontation with the shadow, uh, one-sidedness and the tension of opposites, the transcendent function. Um, he talked about other functions besides the mental functions. And, and that's something that includes environment. So it's not just my brain, it's my mind, all the things I'm thinking about in my environment with you and you with me and, and all of that and everyone listening. So psyche is this really expansive thing and to try and bring sort of the lower level and the upper level together, it's not going to be one-to-one -one correlation, you know, because I, the, our brain is our toolbox or our orchestra. And uh, we developed the tools. It, this is what the data suggests that meet our practical needs, like career needs, cultural needs, um, we call them demands. Uh, and it also meets our psychological needs, hopefully. You know, we find a nice balance with those. So that's what I've been doing is collecting data. I've been really pushed uh, because I, yeah, in the first few years I worked, did this at UCLA, but for the most part, I've been pushed to actually make people practical reports that they can use um and to communicate that in english uh or in some cases in french um and uh, yeah because the french you know they they want their own translations for things and um it, <laughs> a google translates great for french by the way even the french people said it was great um which i'm shocked but of course it's because french people worked on it so it's uh it has really been wonderful to help people discover um, how their brain works. And sometimes it's not in the ways they expected. Uh, if they come in wondering, like, am I this type, like, am I an ENFP or ENFJ? Weirdly, the reason they're having the confusion in real life is because their brain also has some splits in terms of skills that they've had to learn, maybe for their job or the culture they were, you know, if you raised in India and you go to a very traditional Indian school system, you're going to have that judging preference like pounded into you. Mm. And that's uh, different than in America where it's more like, what is your learning style? So it's, um, there, there's, it's really been an adventure and to look at couples and people as they do meditation and all of these things. So it's, uh, I could go on, but you know, I think that really lays out the big picture. Yeah, that's amazing. First of all, I love the fact that you like, I think everyone kind of looks at the neuroscience of personality as like, okay, this is what we know for sure, but what I really love is that you take, and as an INTJ, this isn't surprising, but you take really a holistic approach to this. If you look at it, it's like, this is what we know about 
how the brain's operating on kind of like a hardware level, but you really have to factor in like how these people are raised, what culture they're growing up in, what different influences are coming in to like shape the psyche, which I think is something that the type world doesn't always naturally gravitate towards looking at. Like we want kind of like this prescriptive idea of our type and we want someone to tell us, you're this type, so you're gonna do things this way and this is what career you should go for. And it's really not that simple. So, okay, here's a question. If you learn these things early in life, let's say something that's related to a function that you don't prefer. So for example, I was raised in a family of a lot of uh, TJ types. So it's like I had to call on TE a lot more in my younger years than maybe the average ENFP did. Mm -hmm. Does that make me, um, does that make using it later in life easier for me? Or is it just kind of like, okay, I know my way around more, but I don't necessarily have an easier time calling on it? Uh, you know, there, there's a little bit of both. I would say one is that if you need to work with people or do activities that involve that non-preferred function, you're going to be like, oh, I know how to join in on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, with TJ, parents, it's like, yeah, you know, I've, I, I know how to work with these people. I know how to do this. But, you know, I can say, um, I, I living on the beach in the Caribbean for three years, starting school there, being in a very ESFP culture, because that's what Barbados was, uh, is um, that, that that did not somehow make me any better at doing things that ESFPs as adults can do. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I know how to have fun if it's on vacation, if it's like some physical activity within those. And I'm very happy I have those because mm -hmm. I have some outlets and I meet INTJs who were raised in like a very, you know, like intuiting or thinking household without the sensing. And then they can be pretty unbalanced because what matters almost in our day-to-day -day life, like if you take your 24 hours and ask, how am I spending those hours? Are you spending any hours, to, are you leaving room for your non-preferred functions to have some room to play, mm -hmm. some space to come out? And that's what I mean. It's like you're creating this channel, this space, where sure, you know, I, I could learn maybe surfing as an adult, and I know how I would do it as an INTJ. I'm going to approach it as a task. <laughs> and I'm going to beat myself up if I'm not good at it. And I'm going to set like standards for like how better I'm getting and whatever it is. But I don't need to do any of that. Like I already know how. So it's much easier. And I'd be just like, you know what, then that actually is playtime. Right. And for real extroverted sensing playtime. And, and so it really is about, I would say it's like the stuff that you take if it matches your, from your background, whether it's culture or your family, if it matches your preferences, you got a nice boost that validated you. Mm -hmm. And if it didn't match, then you got a boost in the things that are not you. Mm -hmm. And either way, you're going to go on in life. You just have different material to work with as you grow. But I believe it's all about having a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And, and because it's a type is about development, really, that's its superpower and, um, finding ways to say, yes, you know, you can use, you can do TJ stuff for fun. And I know ENFPs who will clean their house to relieve stress mm -hmm. and it was enjoyable. Yeah, no, I relate to that. And I'm curious, does that, how much can we expect that to change or kind of naturally develop as we age? Is that something that is going to happen whether we consciously work on it or not? Or do you believe that the development of those inferior functions comes more so from conscious effort? Um, Jung said it was both. And he said that there's a push that comes up naturally from the unconscious when we fail to make room for uh, the non-preferences. The non yeah. Uh, and what he meant by that is it's not just in the head. Remember, because psyche is about other people in the environment and all of that. So an ENFP who completely neglects the STJ stuff, like finances, for example, will eventually be bitten in the butt by lack of money, the tax man, all of these things. These are not in their head. The, these are like actual practical things in real yeah. life. It's going to be like that wake up call. And that's, Jung said the unconscious exists everywhere, not just in here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so the stuff comes up and we may for a while try and suppress it, you know, or like take care of it in a little corner. And even if we take care of it in a little way, that's usually like pretty good. It's like, do that. Th that's okay. Like do yeah. that. But if you try and suppress it, this is where all of his patients came to him. They have neuroses. Mm -hmm. And with ENFPs, it's often psychosomatics yep. kind of stuff. Yep. 
Um, and that psychosomatic stuff is an indicator that stuff is in the unconscious, which could be out in the world or inside you, wherever it is that needs to be given breathing room. Mm -hmm. And that's where things like yoga, meditation, um, go and, and take a workshop that's like working on the shadow processes, whatever it is, allow those to give yourself a day off where you're doing something that's like out of the norm, like a craft activity or something. And something's going to come out of that. And then Jung said, it is the job of the ego, the conscious self to go to work and actually like pull that out and say, hey, like, how am I going to develop this? Mm -hmm. And he said, it's a marriage between the unconscious doing the lifting at the beginning and then the ego, hopefully, and this is where you come in, because he said, it's not enough to say, oh, the ego can just deal with these. Like, the person needs sufficient resources and knowledge to know how. Mm -hmm. And for him, people came to him and he's like, I'm the therapist, I'm going to show them how. But you as a coach, like, you're, you're essentially saying, here's the blueprint for how you can take this material and from being like a source of worry or something you're going to push away and actually manifest that in your life in a healthy way. Yeah, one thing I love that you, you'd said to me previously, which I really, really agree with and align with, is um, a lot of people kind of take this approach to developing their inferior functions that are like, okay, if I want more SI in my life, I have to go like live like, you know, an ISTJ or an ISFJ would live and kind of copy people who are using that in a higher stacking way. Um, but you said in the past, like, I really, you really feel like the route to developing those functions is through the more conscious functions. So like SI developing through the heavy, robust use of NE, uh, TE developing through the robust and healthy use of FI. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, absolutely. So Jung observed that, that we really can only develop the other functions in the context of our dominant function. Mm -hmm. So if our dominant function is actually undeveloped, or it is sort of just capped in a certain way, that's actually not room. It's like saying, I want to have all these different things on my buffet plate, but my plate is only this big. Yeah. yeah. And your dominant function is your main entree plate. And it needs to be your main, not the entree, the main. So it needs to be bigger. And so it's actually really good for every type to consider how can I keep growing my dominant function? Mm -hmm. And it's a back and forth. So what allows it to grow is by exposing it to non-preferred stuff. But at the same time, in order to incorporate that stuff, like you need to also go back to what's natural to you and make room for that. Mm -hmm. And an example would be this. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of ENFPs maybe dream their fantasy, maybe it'd be so nice to have like a house with a white picket fence and a dog or two dogs and like this traditional suburban life or whatever it is. I mean, it might happen, but what really ENFP is about is not saying I'm going to get anchored in all of these. It's not just tradition because SJs are anchored in their sense impressions from childhood. So if an SJ was raised by hippies, then yeah. they're going to have hippie sense impressions and that yeah. is the norm. For ENFP, it's about creating a new norm and establishing a new tradition. And we see this so often, like novels that people read in, um, like I remember reading J.D. Salinger stories in, uh, in high school. I'm pretty sure J.D. Salinger was an NF. Uh, a lot of the stories speak, I remember my English teacher for those stories was definitely ENFP, like for sure. Um, I didn't even know type them, but I knew looking back, like she's yeah. ENFP. Yeah. And, um, and I loved the class. And, and it was, uh, you know, the, these stories came, they, they became new American traditions that like millions and millions of people read and are exposed to. Mm -hmm. And the same with films that are shot, uh, marketing campaigns that ENFPs create, like all of these things, like jokes that they tell, um, through the use of extroverted intuiting to weave stories in their lives. I mean, marriage and love are a story. Yeah, and and yeah. Though, that becomes a tradition after 20 years. It's like, oh yeah, like the, the, the romance and the story I've created in my mind about us is us. It is the tradition. Yeah. So it could be very close to home. It could be very broad and cultural, wherever it is. You know, they work, they work hand in hand together. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just one example, but I believe that that's like one that's pretty easy to relate to. Um, and, 
I, I would say the other one, if we're going to talk about midlife, if you want to go into that, is like we can see more of a shift as like a lot of different other ways those come out. Yeah, I would love to talk about that. That's really interesting because I love the idea of ENFPs needing to create a new tradition because I think a lot of us, especially um, in our younger years, feel this kind of pull between the traditional and the new and the novel. And it's like we kind of want, like there's this almost funny stereotype of the NE dom just fantasy, like living this fascinating life and then fantasizing secretly about boring things. And like, I just, I just have this fantasy where I live at home and I like work a nine to five job and everything's normal. And I go home and have the same day a thousand days in a row. That's like our fantasy world. And then our real world is often very um, like novel and exciting and kind of chaotic by a lot of other people's standards. So, but I really love that you put it so aptly. We're trying to create a new tradition. Like I think more and more as the years go on for ENFPs, we start to realize like, this is the kind of variety and the kind of excitement and the kind of novelty that I really need to keep consistent in my life. It's like we, we kind of weave these threads of consistency through all of this seeming like perceived chaos and disorder um, until we come to those traditions that feel more authentic to us than the ones that maybe we were raised in. And just before we, you know, let you go, um, what are you working on these days? Like, where can we find you? Where can we pursue more of your information? Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, I, I'm at DarioNardi.com, although that's not a very interesting place. It's a brochure, but it doesn't have links. <laughs> yeah, it's a brochure, but, but it, you know, it has links to Facebook. And so I hate Facebook, but I'm on it. So it's, uh, it, it serves its purpose. Um, uh, it, yeah, I, it's typical of INTJs. I'm working on like a half dozen projects at once which causes me stress, but somehow I can't do it any other way. Uh, I'm just finishing up this book on self-coaching. And I keep thinking I'm almost done, but the book is now approaching like 340 pages. Wow. And, and it is really all about like every ENFP is going to have 60 pages on ENFPs. I mean, either extroverted intuiting, introverted feeling, and how those, where the, the self-coaching is. Doesn't replace real coach, it's, it's you know, an add-on, but it's a resource. And I really, because I have all these years of doing basically what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm like, and, and even then, by the way, I have to say, like, you bring out with your questions so many more things than would end up in the book. That, that is just like, you know, because there's so many things to talk about. Like, it's, yeah, sure. and that's what COVID-19 has given me is free time to write this like crazy big book. And that's, uh, so that, that's like been the big project. And then my other little projects for those of you who followed the neuroscience, um, I, now that I have well over 350 people and lots of ENFPs, I've really devoted a lot of time to like analyzing that data. Mm -hmm. But you'll probably have to wait like another six months to year be, before I have that. I do want to do an update because 2011 is getting to be like a decade away. Right. Now, yeah. And um, it's time for an update. And that's, uh, that really goes like a whole level deeper and the flavors of every type and more about the, really all about development and, and all of that. Uh, and then the third piece is I personally have become very involved uh, in leveling up my own introverted intuiting, my own dominant function. And I thought in my mid thirties that I basically had maxed out on introverted intuiting and it's a great process, but it's time to like focus on other processes. And, and, and that's true. I mean, that was great, but in order to keep growing, uh, I needed to expand my plate of introverted intuiting. And for me, that's become really involved with the, uh, shamanic practices. And um, I was so impressed by INFJs I encountered. Um, one INFJ woman in particular who just like skills were so amazing. And, and it clearly like so much based in introverted intuiting. And then I found the path that was right for me, which was a practice a little bit more INTJ-like. Um, but really I, I've just loved, like, I have an ISFP student. He calls himself my student. Uh, I have people come every week and, and that's my way of, of using introverted intuiting at a level that I hadn't even imagined, uh, six and a half years ago, like was not even on the radar as like, I didn't even know it existed a whole other level up. 
So just to get, and everybody, I think everybody can know, like whatever their dominant function is, there's always a whole nother level up. INTJs in particular, like I think people seek you out because you do all of this like hard scientific research, right? Mm -hmm. You've done that for so long in the field of uh, psychological type, but it's also cool that you take such an intuitive approach to it. And like, I can see that it's lighting you up to talk about like shamanism and all these different theories that you're learning that are a lot more really like working with people one-on-one -on -one to deal with these very, very not black and white issues. Yeah. Um, so it's just so cool to, to see that like, although you take the scientific approach to your work, your exploration of life runs so much more deeply than that. And I just think that's what makes you such a wonderful contribution to the field of typology. So just on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for all the work that you do and continue to do. Um, because I just think like it's so important and so meaningful. And if you guys are not already out there consuming all of Dario Nardi's work, you need to do it right. Like turn off this lecture and go do it right now because it's such great information. Um, and it's just comes from such a cool holistic approach that I just think is so needed. It's just been a pleasure to talk to you and learn from you and learn more about not only my own mind, but like how all these different minds are wired and how we can kind of work together with that. Um, and I, I think that all the ENFPs watching this are just going to feel very, very um, grateful and inspired afterwards. Um, so hopefully this will not be their last stop on the journey of engaging with your work. Beautiful. Thank you so much for having me. And it was, uh, it was a pleasure the whole time. It was uh, lots of fun. Hey, so you just watched a video that I recorded with Dario Nardi in the summer of 2020, and now it's October 2020, and I am posting the interview now for a couple of reasons. One, so the entire interview has actually been up um, on my ENFP Soul Bootcamp course over the summer. So the entire interview is about two hours long, somewhere around there, and we break it up into a couple different interviews on a couple different topics. But as I was re-watching it in the fall, I was like, wow, this feels so relevant right now because... Dario just released the book that he was talking about at the end of this video, The Magic Diamond, Eight Young's Eight Paths for Self-Coaching, um, and I just finished reading it. And I was thinking that so much of what he goes over in this book was kind of mirrored in the interview, so it'd be really cool to give you guys a bit of info about what it's about. Um, a question that I get a lot is how do I work on developing my inferior functions, whether that's shadow functions or like if you're an ENFP, S-I-N-T-E, if you're an ISTJ, N-E and... FI, um, whatever it is for you, figuring out how to work with our inferior functions or our shadow functions, so those that we don't prefer in our dominant stacking, is a really hard thing to actually figure out in the type world. A lot of people give a lot of advice on how to recognize and how to understand the role of our inferior or shadow functions, but I haven't yet seen a really thorough explanation of how to work with them. And that's something that Dario does really well in this book. So I just finished reading my sections. So I read the section on extroverted intuition and the section on introverted feelings, since those are my two top preferred functions. And what's really cool about this is that he goes into detail on how to work on your shadow functions as the type that you are. So it's not like, okay, how do you work on FI for any type, if it's in your shadow stacking, it's like as an ENFP, how do you work on TI? Or as an ESTJ, how would you work on FE? So he looks at where your functions already fall and then how you can work on your shadow functions in relation to your dominant or more preferred functions to avoid what Young calls one-sidedness, which he goes over a little bit in this interview, but at length in the book. Um, so yeah, this book is a really good tool for learning how your shadow functions show up for you and how you can integrate them in a way that's realistic. And that's a question that I get all the time. And everyone who's asked me this knows that my answer to how to work with your shadow functions or your lesser preferred functions is figure out how you can get them to serve your more preferred functions because you can't develop like TE in a vacuum. You have to look at where is that function falling for me in my stacking and how can I use it to support something higher up so that I'm growing it in a way that's authentic sustainable and ecological in my life. And it's not just me ignoring what I'm naturally good at and naturally inclined to do for a while while I kind of hyper-focus on something and then drop it because it's not realistic. So if you're looking for a tool, um, a self-coaching manual, for learning how your inferior and shadow functions can show up in support of your more preferred functions, this book is a great way to start. Um, I wasn't asked to do this by any means. I just finished reading this and was like, hey, this could be some good information for people. Uh, so I definitely recommend going to either Dario's website or going to, uh, I got this off Amazon and picking up this book if you're interested in it. I'm also doing a three-part workshop with Dario Nardi and Personality Hacker virtually starting tomorrow. 
uh, on the shadow function process and on Dario's approach to it. So I'll let you guys know how that goes, but I'm really excited for it. And I hope that you enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed doing it.